Recently, my wife and I visited Peru. Like all tourists to this South American country, we had to go to Machu Picchu, high in the Andes. It was an amazing city, standing at 8,000 feet, looking out across this city built over 500 years ago and wondering just how did they do this? How did they move granite blocks, some weighing over 50 tons, around the top of this mountain? How did they build to withstand the frequent earthquakes in the region? How did they build irrigation systems and aqueducts that are still functioning today? My wonder didn't stop there. We also visited the south of Peru, a small town called Nazca. It was my first time in an eight-seat Cessna airplane, a dizzying experience as we flew over the Nazca lines. These lines are over 2,000 years old. They're up to a quarter mile long, and they're made by removing the top uh, surface layer of red pebbles exposing the light clay beneath. Archaeologists and anthropologists have studied these lines and really have no clear idea what they're all about. They represent insects, animals, humans, large abstract geometric figures. There's been speculation as varied as alien landing strips, giant weaving looms, uh, perhaps offerings to water gods. The anthropologists and archaeologists have collected a lot of information over the past hundred years, systematically studying the Inca in the mountains and the Nazca on the plains. They've cataloged the building techniques and materials, the arc, uh, agricultural techniques, uh, the social stratification of the Incan empire, uh, the rituals and rulers and their practices. Much like the archaeologists and anthropologists, I study uh, information, and I try to demystify data. I try to present information in a, in a way that communicates to a broader audience. Uh, I try to find the meaning behind numbers and understand why people do what they do. Many of my days are looking at screens like this, row upon row of numbers, and wondering, what's the hidden idea here? What, what is the, the, the message? These numbers might be uh, visits to a hospital, an emergency department for a respiratory illness. They may be people in the community who have a chronic disease, such as diabetes or, uh, um, sorry, diabetes or uh, other uh, chronic issues. Um, it might be housing inf information, such as code enforcement cases, uh, evictions by landlords in civil claims courts. Uh, it may be substandard properties. It's hard sometimes to make sense out of these numbers in a way that can communicate to a broader audience of, of the community, of policymakers and the public. Here's a first attempt to take that same data set and make sense out of it by simply adding color coding to the rows of numbers. Red, for example, in our culture means stop, bad, not good. Yellow, a warning, something that's in transition. Green, good. In this case, we're looking at neighborhoods ranked on the basis of a variety of characteristics, such as vacant properties, substandard homes, number of properties with delinquent tax bills, the level of poverty or the amount of crime in the community, ranking them based on the value of that neighborhood economically. Taking that information just a step further and mapping it, we begin to see inequalities in our community. We begin to, begin to see systematic disinvestment and areas of opportunity for new investment. It allows us to rank and prioritize information and begin to align policies that might address some of the social issues within these neighborhoods. The Center for Community Progress gives several recommendations on what you can do. For example, in extremely weak markets, you might have redevelopment planning or blight elimination uh, plans. In a stable market, a functioning uh, neighborhood, you might need tactical code enforcement to tackle just those few properties that otherwise will bring down property values and create uh, a weaker market. You match this data often with information from municipal sources. This, for example, is tax code information that tells us that some properties are delinquent on their taxes and may be a good opportunity for strategic reinvestment, purchasing this property and turning it into a community garden, a playground, or more affordable housing. I'm going to turn now to talking a little bit about 
indicators of quality of life. We see that in the United States, the average life expectancy is now 78 years. It's actually come down in the past few years. This map shows us county by county the life expectancy across the U.S., and we begin to see some regional differences. The variations in colors tell us that uh, in some places, average life expectancy is well above 80 years, the dark blue, uh, for example. In other places, we see average li life expectancy in the 60s, the yellow and the red in this map. I've done a lot of work in southern Appalachia recently, where average life expectancy is eight years lower than the national norm, 70 years um, in, in, uh, on average. What are some of the factors that we found that are associated with this quality of life difference? Intergenerational poverty, substandard housing conditions, lack of access to medical care and health insurance, the inavailability of healthy foods in a local proximity, and more recently, opioid overdose deaths. I study uh, quality of life all across North Carolina. This is a map of High Point, North Carolina, where we've been doing some work. Life expectancy in High Point is also 78 years long. However, when we look at it at a neighborhood level, we see 17 years difference in just a two-mile radius. 70 years on average in the south of High Point, and just two miles north in the northwest of High Point, 87 years is average life expectancy. So what are some of the factors that contribute to these differences on the neighborhood level? Well, it's really very basic having access to wholesome foods, having access to quality medical care, and having access to good, safe, and affordable housing in neighborhoods with rich amenities. Food insecurity is a significant problem across North Carolina. 15% of North Carolinians are food insecure, and in High Point, that's 19% of the general population. We see that food insecurity is due to low-income, low-food-access neighborhoods. In these neighborhoods, the only food supply is a corner, super, a corner market where you can get energy-dense, uh, cheap, uh, high-carb food that's really nutrient-poor. It leads to obesity and type 2 diabetes. The supply of fresh fruits and vegetables is non-existent or very expensive in these little markets. In those same neighborhoods, we see that adults are getting less than a serving of fresh fruits or vegetables a day, about 18 to 20 percent. This leads to those issues of diabetes and hypertension. So we see that in this map, diabetes is in the same neighborhoods where fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, and uh, a ready supply of fresh foods is lacking. I'm going to turn now to talking about affordable housing and the quality of housing. I spend most of my time looking at housing issues today. Across the United States, half of renters are now cost-burdened. This means that they spend more than 30% of their incomes on housing and housing-related expenses, leaving very little left over for medical care, good foods, education for their children, transportation, and other family expenses. Over the last seven years, we've seen that the cost of housing nationwide has increased over 35 percent. At the same time, real wages have only gone up 5 percent. And the availability of housing has decreased. The green lines show you that vacancy rates have gone from near 10 percent down to 7 percent. The result is that in low-income areas with affordable housing, the margin for landlords is very slim. There's always a renter seeking new housing, there's few vacancies available, and there's little incentive to discount properties or spend additional funds on maintaining those properties. How do we know that the quality of housing has decreased? Well, we trained a team of research assistants at UNCG to investigate housing quality. They conducted a survey of over 78,000 parcels in Greensboro and 16,000 parcels in High Point, looking at 53 items of housing characteristics, from the roof condition to the foundation, the walls, the windows, the paint, and what kind of siding is being used. This information was very important in allowing us to map where substandard housing is concentrated. This map shows a concentration of substandard housing on the basis of scoring 
those properties of roof, foundation, uh, walls, windows, etc. Importantly, housing uh, is related to the health of the community. We find that substandard housing uh, is correlated with several health problems and mental health issues. Asthma, for example, is, uh, affects more than 10 million children in the United States, and it's been linked directly to substandard housing conditions. This map shows us 6,200 cases from one quarter of 2016 from the local emergency department and health clinics, uh, people reporting for respiratory illnesses and asthma. It, it, it shows us a hot spot map very similar to what we saw with substandard housing. Uh, asthma cases are concentrated in low-income communities with substandard housing and little available health care. When we begin to link these data sources together, housing conditions, hospital visits, hotspot mapping of hospital uh, ER admissions, we begin to see which neighborhoods need interventions. Our team includes residents, city officials, hospital employees and staff, uh, researchers uh, across multiple universities. They've targeted these particular neighborhoods for interventions such as rehabbing housing uh, and providing referrals for patients who have uh, asthma that's triggered by substandard housing. Interestingly, we've been able to leverage over four and a half million dollars of social impact investing in one neighborhood alone based on this information. This investment is going to rehabbing multifamily complexes that had clusters of asthma uh, cases. We're hoping that this data and this uh, process can make Greensboro an asthma-safe city. I'm going to turn now to another chronic and uh, a concerning issue within our community, opiate overdose deaths. The use of opiates has increased over the last 20 years, and the opiate overdose deaths now are over 100 every day in this country. Last year, there were 700 overdose uh, calls to EMS uh, within Guilford County alone, and more than 100 deaths uh, reported uh, in our county. This map shows us where overdose reversals occurred. Using naloxone, a life-saving drug that reverses the effects of opiates, EMS, first responders, medical uh, personnel have been able to track where clusters of overdoses occur, and we've begun to match this information with health department data that shows us where there's high incidences of hepatitis C or HIV, diseases that are often spread by IV drug use. It's also allowed us to see that overdoses occur throughout the community. Opiate addiction is spread in all sectors, rural and urban, uh, rich and poor. It's also allowing us to target rapid response programs to those communities that need most uh, to reduce mortality in our community by 20% uh, overdose deaths. In 2005, Jared Diamond wrote his book, Collapse, How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed. He said in this book, a society's fate lies in its own hands and depends substantially on its own choices. I'd like to think that we have the data and the methods to make, that, make choices better uh, for our community, to avoid those uh, collapses that have occurred to, to societies in the past. My wife and I in Peru saw two great societies that no longer exist. Societies that had advanced technology, mathematics, uh, sophisticated governments, agricultural practices, and yet they're gone and no one knows why. I believe that by using empirical data, translating that information into a way that speaks to a public that can make democratic choices, and policymakers who can be most informed, we can avoid the societal collapse that's occurred in other societies in the past. Thank you.